It's about time. Ron. Akira Kurosawa's last masterpiece. A film as beautiful as it is bleak. Ron. A single word, single syllable, translated from the Japanese as... Ran. 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 I swear to God. Okay, according to Wiktionary, it means chaos, or uprising, or revolt, confused, disturbed, and this film is all that and more. But Kurosawa controls his chaos. Drawing on 40 years of directing experience and his background as a painter, Late in his life, he took to painting his storyboards, giving his late work some of the most stirring visuals of his career, particularly in his use of color. Big, bold, primary colors, helping the viewer read the chaos as it unfolds. Huge swarms of brightly hued soldiers crashing into each other, like in this breathtaking sequence, where two armies consume a castle, the yellow and red of their banners doubling the flames. <gasps> The three armies are commanded by three brothers, Taro, the eldest, in yellow, Jiro, in red, and the youngest, Saburo, in blue. They are the sons of an old warlord, Hidetora Ichimonji. This is, of course, based on the tale of another old king who split his lands between his three children. Nope, not that one. Story time. In 16th century Chogoku, in western Japan, aging daimyo Mori Motonari gathered his three sons. He gave each a single arrow, and he told each to break one. And each did. Then the old daimyo took three arrows and bound them together. But this time, none of the sons could break the three arrows at once. The sons learned a valuable lesson. Each son, individually, was weak. But bound together as a unit, they would be strong. Short story, I know, but it's a popular parable in Japan. One that Kurosawa knew well. And like Mori, Hidetora imparts the same lesson to his sons, played beat for beat in this film. But Kurosawa wondered, how strong could those arrows be? <laughs> Enter Shakespeare. I know it's taken me a while to get to Shakespeare, but that's because Kurosawa essentially took the same route. Ron was originally a subversion of The Legend of Mori, and only after several rewrites, it managed to dovetail into a loose retelling of King Lear. Even Kurosawa never quite understood how he stumbled upon it. He'd done Shakespeare before in his previous films, The Bad Sleep Well and Throne of Blood, which I talked about last year, but those adaptations were tighter and closer to the Shakespeare than Ron is to Lear. In this adaptation, roles aren't dropped, but they are split and merged in rather interesting ways. William Shakespeare's King Lear is in part the story of two fathers. Lear, of course, but also Gloucester, father of Edgar and his bastard son Edmund. Both men are essentially good, if foolish, and despite that, they both father good and evil, and both pay for the evil they create. But Hidetora Ichimonji is not Lear. That is, he's not just foolish, he's deadly. He is decidedly not, as Lear calls himself, a man more sinned against than sinning. Hidetora spent his life in conquest, and we see the places he's destroyed, and the lives he's ruined. One life being Lady Kaide. She's roughly analogous to Lear's Edmund, Though she doesn't want power, she wants revenge. Listening to her, there's a sense that Hidetora deserves his fate. And he knows it. I cannot help myself. But even before that, Hidetora expects to be hated. He has a sense of the evil he's brought to this world. 
その方の父母身内を白物ともに焼いたのはこの秀虎じゃそれをなぜそのように見るのじゃ恨みを込めて睨んでくれその方がわしの気は休まる Kurosawa has always been cynical, but here, his pessimism reaches a cosmic scale. Between his sweeping shots of armies, Kurosawa intercuts scenes of the sky. Often to frightening effect. The weather becomes a measure for the state of the world itself. In this film, Kurosawa is shooting from a god's eye view, a god who, more than likely, isn't there. Now, there's a key scene from the play that I want to discuss. Act 4, Scene 6. The Earl of Gloucester, blinded by Regan, is found by Edgar, his legitimate son, though he doesn't know it's him. He asks this supposed stranger to take him to the cliffs of Dover so he can end it all. Edgar, taking kindness on his father, decides to cure his despair by toying with it. He takes his father to a flat plain and tells him it's the cliffs of Dover. And so Gloucester, in his despair, turns his eyes skyward and renounces the gods and. He falls forward. And of course, he lives. And Edgar is right there beside him, telling him what a miracle it is that he survived that great fall. It's a strange scene, a very strange scene. And it's easy to play it as comic, but it's an important scene nonetheless. Kurosawa was clearly moved by this scene because he does it twice. The first to leap is Hidetra himself. With a real clip this time. <laughs> the other Gloucester is Surumaru, first mistaken for a woman, blinded, another victim of Hidetora. Another theme of this film is masculine pride and the havoc wreaked on feminine spheres. Surumaru doesn't fall, but instead he gets the most poignant gesture. In this last shocking final scene, he drops the Buddha, the last thing protecting him, in the gorge. And the film ends with a blind man on a cliff, abandoned by the gods. Kurosawa had lost many old collaborators during this time. Takashi Shimura, his longtime lead actor, died in 1982. Fumio Yanaguchi, his sound technician since the 1940s, collapsed on set and died shortly thereafter. And most tragically, Yoko Yaguchi, his wife of 39 years, died during shooting. Knowing that about the production, there's a profound sense of finality to this film, like he was gathering his friends for one final journey. Among them were his lead, Tatsuya Nakadai, who in his youth played fearsome. Sexual young villains for Kurosawa and others. Here, he plays a man whose life was spent at the sword and sees the world he created die by the sword. Also among them was Hideo Oguni, his co writer, who helped him write The Seven Samurai, Throne of Blood, Ikiru, and The Hidden Fortress, masterpieces all. And on a fascinating footnote in film history, Kurosawa's assistant director on this film was Ishiro Honda. Who catapulted to fame by directing Japan's most famous fable about fears of a nuclear age? There's a deeper connection here. Kurosawa once said in an interview that nuclear apocalypse was on his mind during this time. It was something he would later explore more explicitly in his film Dreams. And since this was post Hiroshima Japan, and more importantly, The mid 1980s, at a hot point in the Cold War, apocalypse was on everyone's mind. Maybe I owe Godar an apology. Shakespeare never could have conceived of an apocalypse, at least not in the way we can conceive it, with environmental or nuclear disaster a very frighteningly plausible reality. But 
Lear comes close. In his other tragedies, someone always takes the throne. In Hamlet, it's Fortinbras. In Macbeth, it's Malcolm. In Titus Andronicus, it's Lucius. But in Lear? It's not so clear-cut. Once Lear dies of a broken heart, the Duke of Albany asks Kent and Edgar to rule together. And Kent refuses. Edgar, in most versions, says nothing. There's no clear assurance that the line of succession will continue. Instead, Shakespeare ends the play with his mind on old age. The oldest hath borne most. We that are so young shall never see so much nor live so long. An anxiety that Kurosawa understood too well. Kurosawa was 75 when he directed this. He was terrified of the future. And it's easy to see Kurosawa himself in the figure of Hidetora as a man who built his legend on the stories of flawed heroes and grand battles faced with his own mortality. <laughs>